Hi CC Essentials Tutors and Families, um, Erica here. I have mentioned on the Essentials Tutor page um, about a binder that I make for my students for in-class use um, and a pencil pouch that I put together and I've had questions about it so I just wanted to go through what I provide for my students. I think it's a really great use of the supply money that, that we collect and um, are able to use for our students and so let me show you what's in um, my pouch. So first of all, um, everybody's stuff just goes into one of these big bags that just made life easier for keeping things together. This is not something that goes home with them. I collect it at the end of the day and it stays with me and I bring it back each week for them. So we have a pencil pouch. I get these just at um, either the dollar store or Walmart. They're like a dollar a piece. We have writing utensils. I have a pencil and a pen. I prefer pencils that are mechanical pencils because then we don't have to worry about pencil sharpeners in class. For dry erase markers, um, this year I had chisel tip markers in the bags. I don't think I'm going to continue with that. The idea was that when they came to the board, if they were doing um, a, a diagram on the board or something for me that they had a good big marker but they tended just to grab mine so it really wasn't necessary but I do um, I will continue putting a black and a colorful um, fine tip dry erase marker in their bags and the idea behind this is um, if they're paired up together and they're playing a math game then everybody has a unique color and so that just makes games a little bit easier in that regard now, I'm not a big fan of um, spending the extra money on the ultra fine markers, especially for class, because the problem is um, they have a tendency, the students, to push hard enough that it doesn't take very long, that they end up flattening that ultra fine tip and it writes just like um, a regular fine tip marker. So that's the experience that I've had um, with my students at home. I've spent the money on those ultra fine and then they just don't write any differently. And I'm also not a big fan of the wet erase markers because they just tend to be really messy. And if you have students who like to just doodle with their dry or with their wet erase markers, um, when they go to clean that up, it's just lots of mess. So I don't recommend those for class. If you, um, some people love them for home use and that's fine. All right, so it, what else I have in here? Um, I have just one of these little erasers. They need some way to erase their dry erase markers. Um, these came in a kit somewhere, but um, just something simple, some fabric of um, some sort. Some of the dry erase markers um, have like the little ends on them that have a little eraser. But again, if you have a student that's drawn a lot with their dry erase marker during class, um, then that doesn't erase very well. It takes forever. So having something that's a little bit more substantial is nice. Uh, this past year I had these little containers of hand sanitizer. I don't know that I'm going to do them again this year. They were sometimes a distraction. Um, and we have sanitizer around and things like that. So the students didn't necessarily need them on their own. So I'm probably going to pass on that this year. Um, one of my favorite things is every student has their own little set of dice. And these are itty, itty bitty little dice, but they're really fun. I'll have to look up the details and the information on the size of the container and the size of the dice and I'll put those links below um, if anybody's interested but what's the way I did the dice is there are three dice in here two of them are the same color one is a different color and the idea behind that is if we're doing a game that requires all three dice then they roll them and they look at them and they can you know say what all three of them are I've got uh, one two and a six but if we're playing a game where we only need two of them, then the two that are the same color are the ones that you're going to look at. That way students weren't just choosing whichever two they wanted and it was, you know, kind of willy-nilly. They always stuck with whatever the two of the same color were. So for this role, it would be the one and the two. In the pouch, I also had a couple of references. So this N2K quick reference, this is something um, that I created. It's uh, on the tutor page. Um, but I just like this reference um, because it has just the basics of what the students are going to use if we're just using a standard roll of uh, dice, one through six. It has all that basic information on it and it has the fractional exponents too so they can reference that quick and easily. I printed out a number knockout board and laminated these so they have these in their pouches and it's a one through 36 board and a threes board just for some variation, a little bit more challenge for those students who are quick at the one through 36 board. And then um, I had a question confirmation bookmark 
that was laminated in here also. This will probably, I'll have to take a look at it and see how it compares to the way things have um, updated in the new guide and see if it's okay the way it is or if I need to do some revamping and some updating and changing on that. But I will probably put the same types of things um, in the bag for next year. So that was everything that went in our pencil pouch. Next, uh, we'll take a look at the binder. So in the binder, and these are just the like 50 cent poly prong binders that um, I picked up at Walmart, I think they're 50 cents a piece. Um, but they hold up pretty well. And then page protectors. That's the main thing that you're going to see here. I bought uh, packages of page protectors from Office Depot. We get a really good deal on them. So um, I would recommend looking into that. So the first section of this binder are the charts. And these are all the master charts. And so we have A and B. You'll notice that I reoriented B. It makes it a little bit smaller. But I wanted students to be able to, when we introduce A and B, I wanted them to be able to see A and B and compare them easily next to each other. And that's harder to do when A is oriented this way and B is oriented this way and you're looking back and forth. So um, I just wanted this to be a little bit easier to look at and make comparisons. Yeah, I also did the same thing with F. Um, I'm not a big fan of F being oriented sideways. Um, I really wish that we stuck with um, the personal pronouns being large at the top and the other pronouns just being listed across the bottom. I think that format was fine um, and I just like the upright orientation better. That's my personal preference. Okay, so we have all the masters. I did want to point out quickly on chart M. On the master there's an error. But the definition of a complex sentence says it is a sentence that consists of at least one independent clause. And so the problem is a complex sentence can't have more than one independent clause. It needs to just say a complex sentence is a sentence that consists of one independent clause and at least one dependent clause. So you can have more dependent clauses, but only one independent clause for it to be a complex sentence. If you have more than one, then you're going to have a compound complex sentence. Um, o, P, Q, um, I'll also point out on here the definition of an infinitive it says an infinitive used as a noun, adjective, or adverb, and it really should be two plus a verb used as a noun, adjective, or adverb. So um, that is something that I'm thinking will be corrected, will be updated, um, just so that you're aware of those little changes. I did in this packet, I didn't include these last year, I did put them in this year. So these are the advanced charts so that um, verb anatomy explained. If we get the opportunity to look at this in class, I want to make sure that everybody has it. Um, B double B and double C, so this is to love in the active voice and to love in the passive voice. I like that they're across from each other. We can look at those and make comparisons about active versus passive. And so I think that will come in handy. And then the verb moods. So those are the advanced charts. I have a blank sleeve in here. And this will probably, once we introduce all of the parts of speech, I like to play parts of speech as categories. And so once we get to that point, I will probably put one of those sheets in here so that we can play that game, you know, whenever we decide that we're going to play it. And it's just here ready to go. So that's kind of waiting for that point in time. I didn't get it printed to put in here. So next I have a section for the analytical tasks. So we can look at this together. We can use this. Um, so tasks one, two, and three, I kind of edited, edited this page a little bit. Um, it always comes with only two lines for writing the sentences. And as our sentences get longer, um, that's just not enough room for most students to be able to write out a compound complex sentence. So um, I edit it so that there are four lines, there's lots more space, and then this is the whole space for diagramming instead of having that small space at the bottom. So this is just how I change this a little bit. And then um, this is a work in progress. I'm working on making a version of the Quidditch Quo that's as close as can be to you know what we already have. That way we can look at this together in class and everybody has um, a copy that looks very comparable to whatever is in the guide. So this is, like I said, a work in progress. I'm almost there. That is that. And then task five. And then I have math games. So here's a section here. And I want to point out 
Office Depot uh, messed up on my printing. These pages, these like title pages, were supposed to be printed on colored paper and they didn't do that. So um, that will just help it to stand out for the students. They can look for that green page or whatever to find the different sections. So math games, I have a bigger version of that quick reference for N2K, uh, 1 through 36 N2K board. And then there's a, uh, a starter set of equations up here. So students who are newer to it, this can help get them started and thinking about how they can manipulate those numbers and knock numbers off of the board. But then there's lots of space across the bottom so that students can um, use that space for their calculating and manipulating the numbers and doing their N2K work. Um, this is just another quick reference. This just has more information on it. This goes all the way up through nine um, and it has all the squares and cubes. So this just has more information on it. And then I have a threes board. My students like to play snake. So we have a copy of snake, multiplication squares, uh, multiplication for in a row, and the area game. So those are just some of the math games that I have in here. I have a uh, room there for whatever we need and then another blank one in here. That way, if we decide we're gonna play bingo one day, I'll give them a bingo page and they can slide it down in there. Or, you know, whatever it is that we're doing, there's room for them to add things um, as needed throughout the year. So um, I put these together. It is a lot of work to put together. I send a lot of things to Office Depot. I have to stuff the page protectors, um, but it is very worth it during class when I tell everybody to open up to chart F. We're gonna learn about um, pronouns today and they can find that easily, and I know everybody has the exact same information. I can help them find it from the front of the class, um, reminding them that they're in alphabetical order. You know, start at the beginning and find chart F. And so um, it has made class run a little bit smooth, more smoothly. And um, so that's what I use, and I hope you found that helpful. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Have a great one.